Hello everyone, welcome to the second of a series of webinars entitled AI Talks at the ETUI. My name is Aida Ponce del Castillo and I will be your host. Today we have a special guest, Professor Helga Nowartny, a leading science and technology scholar. She is Professor Emerita of Science and Technology Studies, ETH Zurich, and former president of the European Research Council. She has held teaching and research positions at many universities and research institutions in Europe and continues to be actively engaged in research and innovation policy at the European and also at the international level. She's currently a member of the Board of Trustees of the Falling Walls Foundation in Berlin, Vice President of the Lindo Nobel Laureate Meetings, and a member of the Austrian Council for Research and technology development. She received multiple honorary doctorates, including from the University of Oxford and Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel. Last September, Helga published the book entitled uh, In AI We Trust, Power, Control, Illusion, uh, Power, Illusion and Control of Predictive Algorithms. And today we will have a conversation about it. So Helka, thank you for being here. Thank you to the audience for being here as well. And let's kickstart our session with one but very basic question. Helga, in your view, what is AI and what's the power of predictive algorithms? Thank you so much, Aida, for this invitation. And it's a real pleasure to be with you today. And as Aida already said, um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, my book. And let me just share the slide with you so that you see here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you see here the, the title again. This is um, again, no, this does not work. Sorry. <clears throat> Again, um, <clears throat> the title of my book. And now we come to the question that Aida just posed, what is AI? And I want to put it into the larger societal context of uh, digital technologies. Of course, you have heard uh, many different uh, definitions of AI. It evokes different reactions in it. There are people who are very fearful, first of all, that it might take away our jobs in the future, but also that it might uh, make humans superfluous because intelligence suggests that these digital technologies are developing to be more, not only faster, but uh, more clever than we are. And in the end, we will lose out against technologies. This is an old fear that goes back, but it is important to keep in mind one very basic um, <clears throat> component of all technologies. They are invented and created by humans. And <clears throat> the American historian of technology, David Nye, many, many years ago, he said artifacts emerge as an expression of social forces, of personal needs, of technical limits, of markets, of political considerations. So there's a wide societal context in which we have to look at these uh, technologies. And this is what I will try to do. So <clears throat> I uh, selected three definitions among the many, because I found some definitions, I would call them naive, some are realistic and some are speculative. And I want to share all three with them. But my basic line is that we have engaged with these digital technologies on a fantastic journey into the future, which is based on an interaction between us and the digital machines created by us. This is very important to remember throughout when we speak about AI. 
we create them and it is also in our power to shape them at least to some extent in this broad societal context in which we are all embedded. Now let's look at a naive definition. The simulation of human intelligence in machines. So we want them to think like us and we want them to be able to mimic what we do. Why is it naive? This is how it started out because on the technological side, this was based on a mathematical definition on formal reasoning. And it started with um, a young graduate student who did not even have his PhD at the time, Alan Turing. You probably have heard his name in connection with the Turing machine and his um, <clears throat> very tragic uh, life uh, because he was persecuted um, <clears throat> as, as, as a gay person and probably took his own life. But he was a young, upcoming a very uh, talented mathematician uh, working at the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton. And he wrote a little uh, paper in 1936 on computational numbers. And there he showed that you can have something like a code, which later became connected to hardware, the first computers, and this is the basis of it all. But it was based on mathematical formula that allowed to simulate formal reasoning. Now, very quickly, it turned out that um, it was fantastic, but in terms of practical applications, it did not go as far as people had hoped. And there is even a period in this very first um, phase of development, a period which is called the AI winter. And by this, um, people meant that funding dried up. So at first, as always, when there is a new technology, you know, everyone jumps on it. There's a bandwagon effect. And then um, the air is full of promises, but you know, it took time to be able to deliver. And then funding dried up and people started to look for other ways. And there we come to a more realistic definition because um, especially in the last 20 years, it really started only at the beginning of this century that um, neural networks came up, something which is called machine learning or deep learning. In other words, one no longer tried to emulate how humans think, but to look for patterns and to use digital machines to find patterns and use this for solving problems. So a new definition came up and uh, <clears throat> I put it here in, in, in the words, any system or an agent, sometimes an AI is referred to as being an agent that perceives its environment and takes actions that maximize its chances of achieving goals. Now, perceiving its environment is very important. You have heard of, uh, <clears throat> you know, this um, very, um, broad ways to come up with automated vehicles, cars that are self-driving, etc. Very often people then wonder, well, what if this car runs over a human on the street or does not see the kangaroo uh, in Australia because it has not been programmed to see the, the kangaroo, etc. Now, we have to remember, and this is always a trap because we tend to think that machines see the world like we do, but they don't. A, a digital um, a car, an automated car, does not see on the street people. It sees patterns. And when you use sometimes uh, Google, you are asked to identify um, images <clears throat> to, to see is there a, a bird, is there a um, a car in the picture, etc. This is just to help to train the machines to see certain patterns. They don't see the world like us. So this is very important. It perceives the environment in a specific way. It takes actions, but it's always linked in a functional way to having a goal. And the goal has to be very clear 
because otherwise the machine gets confused. So this is the realistic uh, definition to answer Aida's question. And then we still have a speculative definition, which is, I would call it the uh, ultimate goal. People are dreaming since the beginning to reach something that is called artificial general intelligence. And uh, by this, it's meant the ability, the hypothetical ability, because we are not there as yet, of an intelligent agent. So again, you have the agent to understand and learn any task that a human being can. So then they would be like us. It's not that they would imitate us, but they would be able to learn and you know, unfold like uh, human beings. We come to the world as, as babies, we have to learn uh, to develop our cognitive abilities, our um, <clears throat> motion, uh, etc. Until a baby can walk, it takes almost one year. So um, in, a, in a sense, to treat this artificial general uh, intelligence in, in a similar way. Now, it is utopian and dystopian at the same time because there are people who think this will solve all our problems once we have reached this, and others think this will be a nightmare and we would rather not want to get there. And you also may have heard about the singularity. This was a, a term coined by an inventor, uh, Ray Kurzweil, um, in, in 2005. And he uh, was <clears throat> speculating also on this acceleration that you see in this uh, technological development, an exponential increase in, in computers, in the way how we can use genetics, nanotechnologies, AI, etc. And he predicted in the year 2045, so we still have some time until then, you know, there will come the point where all this will come together and we will have this general um, artificial intelligence or artificial general intelligence that will be just uh, able to, to, to be like us. So, but this is speculation. And some people um, consider this an existential risk uh, for humanity and are warning against it. Others think, you know, this is um, the future of the human species. We have evolved up to a point until now, and then we will just uh, be taken over and fused with AI. So much um, <clears throat> for the uh, definitions of AI. But my take away message for answering this question is really to come back to what I, I said before. Let's remember artificial intelligence and digital technologies are created by humans. And um, <clears throat> we will eventually um, have to learn how to live with them and use them for our purpose rather than letting them run uh, amok and, and uh, becoming wild. Now, these digital uh, technologies also do something with, um, with the way how we experience time. And it's not just of speeding up things. We all have this feeling um, in uh, you know, previous centuries uh, even, but also if we look back a generation or, or so, you know, life was much uh, at a much more calm uh, pace, uh, things were not so hectic, uh, etc. So speed is certainly something, this acceleration is something that is connected to technologies. But digital technologies um, did something more. Um, if you think back of industrialization, the 19th century industrialization on a broad basis, the time uh, experience underlying it was the linear time of the clock. The clock regulated not only factories and work in the factories, it became the hallmark of our modern life was regulated by this linear time. You could cu uh, cut time into equal pieces. You could, um, <clears throat> uh, by increasing productivity, the famous saying, um, 
time uh, <clears throat> is money. In other words, you know, you can produce more in less time, so become more productive, more efficient, uh, etc. And now, in addition to that, this does not disappear completely, but in addition, we have something like digital time. And digital time means it is recursive. It can go back. You have feedbacks. You have, in other words, something that in, tech, in technical terms is called nonlinearity. You have something that is inherent to a complex system. And this um, is an interesting um, perspective to look at digital technologies because it also confronts us in novel ways together at the same time with the long-term view, the medium and the short term. And what I mean by that is the long term, <clears throat> if we go back, we can see when did it start, when did these digital technologies come about? Well, the origin, as I said, go back to, uh, well, even before, uh, you always had predecessors and um, you had Leibniz already in, in um, <clears throat> the 17th century, um, who, uh, in, in the 18th century, sorry, uh, who had a machine that run on one and zeros. In the 19th century, you had Babbage, you had Ada Lovelace, a woman, who um, you know, was working in the same way. It really came about when software and hardware met in the form of what we call a modern uh, computer. And this goes back um, to uh, the mid of the last century. And interestingly enough, this is also the time when we now hearing and speaking so much about the Anthropocene, the, the geological epoch in which we now live, where we see it's humans that change the natural environment uh, and the planet on which we live and which is our only home so far. Um, <clears throat> but there is an interesting temporal um, convergence of, of, of the two. And um, dealing with the Anthropocene and the effects of climate change, again, we are confronted with different temporalities. It goes far beyond human experience. We have nonlinear cycles of oceans interacting with the atmosphere, etc. But at the same time, we have also the medium term, uh, <clears throat> medium term perspective. And here <clears throat> I mentioned already industrialization. And we have had different, what um, historians of um, economic innovation call techno-economic paradigm changes. The whole economy and the society change, paradigmatic change, because they are based on a new source of energy, on a new kind of technology that becomes very pervasive. We had this starting with industrialization, the mechanics, we had it with electricity. Uh, if you think of electrification and the way how it changed uh, the economy, um, you had railroads, uh, etc. And now we have a digital um, economy also with digital platforms, etc. And um, historians of innovation like uh, Carlotta Paris, for instance, she looked at these previous paradigm changes and she found some common patterns, although the technologies were different. What she found, among other, is that there tends to be a concentration of power. There are few firms, individuals in firms that are able to concentrate what is happening and of course derive also a disproportionate benefit from it that um, can also be called winner takes all. And at least in the past, unless there was a political will to um, <clears throat> have a new legal basis, of um, changing um, the trust laws in the US, et cetera, this heavy concentration would continue. And um, there are many good reasons to think that we, um, that digital technologies are indeed another techno-economic paradigm change, because we also see this enormous concentration of power. 
And we all heard about Elon Musk taking over Twitter these days. So here you have a very good example of one individual, you know, concentrating an enormous um, uh, power in the sense of being uh, able to influence what people read, what they say, uh, what is allowed, what is not allowed, uh, etc. But in the short term, and that's another driver, of course, we have the benefits and we all um, enjoy the benefits. No one would like to go back to the time before a smartphone um, and, and before the way of working. We could not talk to each other this way. So we see all the benefits, but we also have the risks and we will also speak about uh, the risks. Now, let me come to the second part of my presentation, the power of predictive algorithms in particular, where does it come from and how does it affect us? Now, um, the power of predictive algorithm uh, is of course related and builds uh, upon a convergence of several, of several strands. And it would not have been possible before all this, what you see here on my slide, came together. First of all, we have unprecedented computational power. Some of you might still remember or having seen what computers looked like only 30, 20 years ago. They were huge. And now we have computers in our wristwatches, in our smartphones. We have sensors all over, also wearing fit bands, uh, et cetera. So we have these tiny sensors, the tiny computers surrounding us everywhere. And of course, <clears throat> this would not be possible without microchips and without um, having this unprecedented uh, power in, in, in computation. But we also, um, this is often overlooked because it's largely not visible. Um, with electricity, you knew, you saw the electricity poles everywhere going up in the countryside. But uh, the broadbands are usually under the ground. We don't see so much of the infrastructure that is necessary to have digital technologies function the way how they, they function. But then you need also very sophisticated algorithms that are basically, they are formulas, but it's, they are built into a very complex um, assemblage. And so it's not so easy to pull them out and to say, this is an algorithm. And in addition to that, uh, many large corporations don't publish their algorithms, so we don't really know how they work and what they are and how they are changed. And then in order for this to function, we need this enormous amount of, of data. And here I only refer to um, Shoshana Zuboff's surveillance capitalism, which in which she shows how we all are colluding with the large corporations because we readily um, offer them our data even about uh, more intimate parts of our life, of our emotions even, because we get something back that we value, namely convenience. We can tap into our phone and we get information. Google is everywhere. Um, we can ask where is the next restaurant or we get addresses. We get all this back in exchange, but um, the whole enterprise, the business model thrives. Uh, the uh, advertisement, which is part of the business model, thrives on extracting more and more data from us, but also we being an active part of offering um, these, these data. So where do the predictive algorithms come in? Now, as the word prediction uh, says already, it has to do something with the future. And um, humans 
if you go back in history and if you go to all parts of the world, ancient civilizations, but also small tribes living in the, in, in the Amazonas or in, in Africa or wherever, you always find something that was connected to divination, to, um, <clears throat> to the wish <clears throat> and the fulfillment of the wish to know what is in hold for people in the future. And uh, <clears throat> so in, in practically all cultures and civilizations, there were oracles, the, the Chinese had these wonderful oracle bones um, where they were using the cracks of sheep and turtles held over fire to divine, <clears throat> there were specialists, of course, who, who could do this and telling the ruler what, uh, what would happen in the future. Now, <clears throat> we no longer practice divination, but we are still as much interested as our ancestors about what the future will bring. We write uh, reports on the world in 2030, 2040, you have, uh, you know, research units in, in the large corporations, in the large organizations who want to know what, uh, what, is, what is coming, you have foresight exercises, etc. And um, also <clears throat> management, uh, business are very much interested in what will the markets of the future look like, etc. And now we have predictive algorithms. And the prediction comes in because it is related to decisions that are taken. Um, <clears throat> because it's nice to know a prediction, but you want to know a prediction in order to be able to, to react. You want to um, either <clears throat> prevent something to happen, so you take preventive action, or you want to make a bet on something that is uh, <clears throat> told to you through the prediction. You want to use it for and, and exploit it for your uh, benefit, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But in very practical terms, it's the decision making uh, that is based on uh, predictive algorithms. And <clears throat> the, um, these predictions are built into the decision-making and of course they need, uh, they need data. So in business, uh, the simple economics of AI, as it is called, you can do away with, um, uh, with people in, in a firm that used to make uh, decisions because you find out by and large, there is a strong tendency to repeat what happened in the past. Because, and this is also something we tend to forget very often, the um, predictive algorithms are based on data from the past. The future has no data as yet. We tend to forget that. The data come from the past. And very often, um, I mean, humans, we have a, a certain tendency also uh, for structures to persist because life would be unbearable if everything changes from one day to the next. And so this is exploited through automation based on these predictive algorithms. In institutions like uh, in, in the US, the police, the judiciary use it uh, uh, already. And uh, there the, the police or the judges look uh, and rely on predictive algorithms to make a decision, um, is this person likely to become a recidivist, in other words, to commit a crime again or not, based on the past behavior of this person. And then you extrapolate and the judge says, well, this person very likely will commit a crime again, so we will not let him out or her out. Or the police um, tries to do racial profiling and other uh, horrible um, um, behavior in order to pinpoint to people whom they want to um, take out of the system because they are considered to be dangerous. Also in education, it happens, the schooling reports and many other areas. 
But I wanted to tell you one uh, specific example from the Austrian Labour Market Service, which is uh, based on a very simple uh, algorithm, like other labour market services, and this is in Austria a very well functioning one. Um, they they are there to help um, unemployed people to find um, to, to find jobs. And so, what um, the the management of the Austrian labour market service did was to say, um, we we have uh, three groups: uh, our our customers, our clients. Uh, we want to segregate them into three groups based on so-called objective criteria, like how old are they, the sex, the qualifications, duration of previous unemployment, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, the algorithm can predict the likelihood, the likelihood of finding employment in the future that matches with what they bring their, uh, their, their qualifications. Now, <clears throat> this was done um, to spur efficiency, to speed up the process of helping people to find, but it, there was a public outcry. Because uh, when this became known, people felt it was discriminatory. Um, the data reflect only the status quo. A woman who had to, who was unemployed, who had to take care of a disabled relative or a husband, etc., uh, was considered less likely like another woman who did not have these additional responsibilities, um, etc. So the algorithm had no answer for the vulnerability and the specificities of certain um, uh, people. So by now, <clears throat> then the, the agency uh, defended itself and said, look, um, you know, there are also informal practices, not the same time was always devoted, um, et cetera, because the aim, of course, was you help those that are most likely to find employment as quickly as possible. You look after the middle category and you should not neglect the, the last category, et cetera but it was perceived in a different way. Now, <clears throat> what is interesting is um, that this kind of automation of uh, AI that is predicting something, <clears throat> of course, um, it was very transparent. So when you speak about transparency, you know, you always have to think and look a second time because it was very transparent. The criteria were there, how the AI worked. It was very simple. There was nothing, and yet, you know, we felt it was unjust. So what else does um, do these predictive algorithms do with us? Now, <clears throat> it raises, of course, the question of who ultimately decides, uh, <clears throat> and this is something to which we have to come back, um, and these ultimate uh, decisions, like uh, I mentioned the judiciary system, now in every judiciary system, you usually can make a recourse. If a judge uh, uh, issues a verdict, normally you can go to a higher level court until you reach the highest level, and, and, and that's it. If, um, and it took, uh, unfortunately, some accidents, an airplane that flies completely with an automatic pilot reaches a dangerous situation, the automatic pilot has to be switched off so that the pilot takes the decision. So this is something that, that we have learned and that we have to keep uh, in mind, that ultimately there should be a recourse, there should be a human in, in control. But let me let me go back to 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 the risk uh, that I mentioned here, the risk of self-fulfilling prophecies. What happens, and this is where the power of these predictive algorithm comes in, we tend uh, to believe that what the prediction says will actually come through. And um, in reality, as mentioned before, the past does not necessarily uh, mirror the future. The future can be very different, even if uh, certain patterns persist in the future. It's always based on probabilities. 
and the predictive algorithm can never say something with absolute certainty because there is no absolute certainty. We still are in a world filled with probabilities. But when people start to believe it, this becomes self-fulfilling prophecies. People act as though what they are being told will actually come about. And there's the famous run to the bank uh, when the rumor spreads, uh, you know, banks will close and get your money out before they close. And many other examples of such self-fulfilling prophecies. But there's also another aspect which uh, I think should be considered. It took humanity thousands of years, and it was mainly with the help of science um, that we reached a point where we no longer believe that our future has been predetermined, preset by some higher power, be it God or the gods um, that know what is coming and there is no way out. In other words, a deterministic worldview. And this is something that um, <clears throat> we, we have to bear in mind. We should not uh, fall back into this um, deterministic worldview because um, the future is open. And uh, <clears throat> we cannot control the future, but we can um, attempt, and I think it's also our obligation to attempt to shape it. And this is why I call it the prediction paradox. Um, we use AI, we use predictive algorithm to seek control over the future and uncertainty by knowing what is coming. We can see further ahead, we can prevent, we can prepare. Um, <clears throat> But uh, the AI and predictive algorithms have the power to make us act in the ways it predicts. And this reduces our agency over the future. We transfer our agency to a machine, to a digital machine. So what is to be done about it? And here I come to my uh, last part, which uh, is about keeping humans in the law, and I would call it, are we moving, and this is of course the question mark, are we moving towards uh, a digital humanism? Digital humanism is a kind of movement that has started among other places, also here in Vienna. There is a digital um, humanism manifesto that was published in 2019. Since then, um, there are uh, bi-weekly uh, seminars on, on the topic. There is a growing network. There is a book, an open access book, with um, some over 40 short articles on perspectives on digital humanism. How can we keep humans in the center of these technological developments? Now, <clears throat> what are the challenges that we face when we want to move towards a world where digital humanism um, is a kind of regulative imperative in whatever we do. We are confronted with the illusion of technological control that we are in control of technology. Again, this is a very old topic because with every uh, technology, there was always the question how to control it. You want to prevent accidents, you want it to function in certain ways. Um, and if we look back at industrialization, you know, it eventually, between, after many um, struggles, you know, we, we ended up with a kind of social security system that allowed people to become assured against accidents. We have accident prevention programs. We have um, unemployment uh, um, payments against um, the accident of losing one's, one's, one's job. These are ways of trying to get control, be it of the technology itself, as with accident prevention, be it with having some kind of insurance system to uh, mitigate the negative consequences. So from this point of view, it's an old topic, but with digital uh, technologies, uh, there are some specificities that make it uh, <clears throat> harder to how to have this kind of 
control. First of all, use, abuse, and misuse, uh, this can be done with any technology. But it's never the technology alone. It's humans, stupid. It is humans who use it, who can abuse it, to misuse it. Um, we have errors. And both technologies and digital technologies are prone to errors as are humans. But the interface becomes much more complex. Human machine uh, interfaces as working with machines, this was identified very, very quickly. You have to uh, pay special um, attention to it, but now it becomes much harder because of the, the complexity. And then with data, 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 we have uh, biases creeping in. And we all have our biases. Humans are biased in, in many ways. But if these biases <clears throat> become part of the way how the data are collected, how the data are being categorized, uh, you know, there's a politics of categories, a politics of classification, um, then it can become something which is very harmful. And here I mentioned just two um, lessons from, from the past. Norman Accidents is, is a book by Andrew Perry, written in 1984. This was after the Three Mile um, Island uh, <clears throat> accident of the, the first nuclear uh, accident in Three Harbor Island. Um, and Andrew Perry said, um, uh, normal accidents means, um, you know, whenever you have complex interactions between system components that are not visible, that are um, not uh, understood at, uh, very easily, and a tight coupling of the system that does not allow you a lot of flexibility, input directly leads to output, then you get these normal accidents. He was describing the complex system of nuclear energy creation. But now you know, we have a complex system of the way how digital systems function. So we have to pay <clears throat> uh, special attention to these um, complex interaction between system components and, and also this, this tight coupling. And high resilience organizations refers to way how organizations have learned, uh, especially in the financial markets after the financial crashes. You know, how can you avoid um, <clears throat> Um, the, you know, errors, uh, biases, um, whatever in this um, unforeseeable interaction between component parts can be done. And there is a checklist of things that, that can be done. But <clears throat> these are some lessons from the past, uh, but things are becoming more complex. And AI reinforces, we have to confront this uh, in a very open way, power structures that exist already in society. The biases in society are reinforced and there are many empirical studies that show this through the data, through algorithms. Ownership uh, remains a very thorny issue. You have people discussing, well, we should all own our data, but uh, sometimes these are very naive approaches because of the very complexity. And then there is also, again, this question, who controls autonomous um, decision-making? Where is the human in the loop? Now, <clears throat> how to keep humans in the loop? Let's look at what have been the reactions so far. How far do they take? But I would say the most challenging indeed is regulation, regulation, regulation. And it is, uh, it is difficult, um, it's an ongoing struggle and I will turn to it right away. Then people, and this is uh, an understandable reaction, people say, well, we need ethics, we need a beneficial AI, we need an ethical AI, let's just do it necessary, but as I will also show, it's not sufficient. And then there is a change of the cultural mindset. How do we approach these digital, uh, digital technologies? How do we live with an AI knowing about what it can do for us, 
which is beneficial for us, which is good also, not just for the individual, but also for the common good. And um, how can we also perhaps, you know, educate an AI to <clears throat> be more open to our own values and what we treasure? But let's start with regulation. I call it an ongoing struggle. Regulation is never simple. And one of the reasons is that uh, technology and the, the law have a very uneasy relationship because the law always lags behind technology. Technological developments are faster than the law can keep up. And if you regulate too early, you are stifling innovation. And if you regulate too late, well, you can have a number of very unpleasant surprises that are very difficult to rein in again. So it's a, it's, it's a difficult um, <clears throat> relationship between law and, and, and uh, or forms of regulation and technological development. But also, and this is where geopolitics comes in, 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 in a very visible way, we see today <clears throat> um, that we have a technology with very different attitudes in Europe, in the US and, and China. In Europe, we are proud of European values and we want to have a regulation that takes into account our values. In the US, you have pretty much a free for all. So the more <clears throat> freedom of everything, uh, the better. And in China, you have a tightly controlled system by the, by the Chinese leadership um, <clears throat> that, of course, claims it's for the benefit of citizens, but it's very tightly controlled. And uh, in the international um, uh, geopolitical tensions today, we see also that uh, there is uh, an underlying struggle going on for, for dominance in terms of where will the future technological developments go and what does it in fact mean when you regulate in one way or the other or not at all. You know about the legislation in progress at EU level, the Digital Markets Act, the Digital Service Act, the Digital Governance Act, and more is to come, which shows how Europe is, is, is trying to, to have uh, its say, to leave its mark and to live up with all compromises that have to be um, entered, uh, to live up to something that we call European values. And then you have, um, whatever you do, you have the question of AI governance. And this has a sort of normative part where you can say, okay, we want to have um, things like the common good or security, these are normative principles. You can have practical principles like fair, uh, that data and must be foundable, uh, accessible, uh, interoperable uh, and, and reusable and other practical principles. Now, as I said, you know, the first impulse is we call for ethics. And of course, everyone is for ethics. And you have uh, the large corporations that are setting up ethical boards. Um, some people call it whitewashing, but uh, there are ongoing <clears throat> attempts to introduce an ethical uh, dimension. But ethics is not a checklist. And you can have many principles that um, try to answer what we understand by an ethical AI, like transparency, explainability, trustworthiness, fairness, and, and, and others. But there are problems with it. And there was one study <clears throat> that I quote here that uh, showed um, <clears throat> that there is no consensus on these principles. This study was uh, done at ETH uh, Zurich. Uh, looking at ethics guidelines, public documents, half of them came from governments from all over the world, and the other half came from 
um, large businesses. They all had ethical guidelines. Everyone was very proud we have an ethical guideline. But looking at about uh, almost 100 documents, there was no consensus as which principles really mattered. The principle that came out in almost 50% was transparency. But, you know, it was a, a kind of depressing outcome. You look, everyone wants to sign up to ethical guidelines, but then there is no, um, you know, definition that everyone agrees to, but not even signing up to a priority of, of principles. And the other drawback, of course, is there is nothing on implementation. You can have guidelines, you can have principles, but when it comes to implementation, where and how can you implement it? Uh, who can impose sanctions if the principles are <clears throat> not being observed or deliberately um, <clears throat> pushed, pushed aside, etc. And <clears throat> I found um, a, this was a talk given by, um, by an American by the name of David Danks that I found very, very helpful. He looked at what are the current approaches to ethical AI and what are their drawbacks? Because only if we confront um, the limitations, can we move forward? And so he says, well, uh, there are three categories. We have principles, like the ones I, I just mentioned, with ethical components, but basically they are context insensitive. So, um, you know, transparency, like in my example of the Austrian labor market service, trans uh, you cannot say it was not transparent. It was very transparent. But uh, it left out the need for something that we call social justice. And so there are many other examples where the context and the principle don't really match because the principle is context insensitive. Then there are ethical algorithms, <clears throat> so-called ethical algorithms, that where you try to um, insert ethical procedures. And uh, one example is the um, <clears throat> autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars. Uh, you want to make sure that they don't run over people. But um, if you have a, 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 an algorithm, it's very difficult um, at the level of how technology works to make a car realize what is an individual that you should not run over. And therefore, <clears throat> um, many of these attempts simply ignore how technology actually works. And then you have uh, ethical systems behavior. They want to look at the outcome, for instance, have human rights been uh, respected in, in, in what the system does? You have audits of, of the system. Um, which again is fine, but it requires specificity that is implausible. So I think um, this is a useful summary, you know, what are the drawbacks, the limitations? So Thank you, Helga. Work? Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I, I will hurry up. Sorry. Um, I am almost finished. So let me jump to my outlook. This is the last uh, slide before, because I thought you might be interested in the future of work. So let me just say, I think automation will continue. Nobody knows how fast new jobs will replace old ones. And because this demands, uh, depends on many factors, the role of the trade unions, new work ethics. And there is this famous talk by <clears throat> John Maynard Keynes from the year 1930, where he predicted <clears throat> what the world will be like um, now, <clears throat> 2030. And uh, one of his predictions, most of them were right, but one, he was obviously wrong. He said, we will only work um, 18 hours uh, per week in the year 2030. So I stop and I'm sorry for overstepping um, my time.
Oh, thank you so much. No, I, 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 I'm sorry for interrupting you, but it has been a fantastic talk and we have lots of questions from the audience. Yes. Helga, thank you so much. And I will really quickly like to uh, pick up two questions from yes. mm -hmm. Maya Mitre and from Luis Fernandez here who are listening to us. And Maya, uh, Maya Mitre, she's saying that, yeah, she's working as well in the human in the loop. Uh, which is a very interesting concept, but many other academics argue that human in control and human in the loop does not make decisions better or more fair. And most of the time, it only makes processes slower. What do you think, what's your opinion about that? And I would like to couple this question with, um, with um, the question from Luis Miguel Fernandez saying that technology is, not, is neutral. I have my personal view about that, but perhaps I would like you to answer that, Helga. She, he said that technology is neutral, humans are not. And at the end is the interaction and the link between both that create the, the problem. So perhaps some thoughts about that, Helga, uh, before I step, uh, I, I ask you more questions yeah. from the audience. Okay. Thank you. So my, my answer to the first question is, um, you know, it may slow down processes, but we also learn then once we understand better, the processes can again be uh, become faster. What I think it is more important is, can we identify intervention points? You know, I come back to this question of complexity. We still tend to think we can separate special units and only look at those but there are interlinkages from the design to the production, to the use, to what happens then. And you have to find and ask yourself, and this is varies by domain, it's very specific, where are intervention points? And then how can these intervention points be followed up and interlinked? And so, you know, it's, it's a complex system and we have to find also more um, complex answers in the sense that there is no silver bullet, there is no simple recipe. Uh, moral intents are good and nice to have, but they will not bring us further unless we really delve into the specificities and find these uh, intervention points where it makes sense to intervene, how to intervene, how to see how it's interlinked to the next intervention. You have to keep up with the with the complexity of the, of the system. Now to the second question, uh, you know, many people uh, say, and I know this is um, widespread idea, technology is neutral. Technology is not neutral. It's not never innocent, you know. Uh, it is um, something that emerges to fulfill certain personal needs, but uh, needs are not the same for everyone. So every technology can benefit some groups in society more than others, unless we have counter mechanisms of making sure that they can benefit everyone. And uh, so it's, <clears throat> it, it is very important to look at the link of humans and of technology, but we also have to see how are benefits derived from technology or risks uh, connected with technology, how they, are they distributed in society. And uh, this is why I started uh, to put your definitions, uh, your, your question, into the larger societal context. Let's not only focus on individuals, but let's see what does it do for society, with society, and with different groups in society. And there are different needs there are different resources um, and they are unequally distributed. And we have to make sure that uh, this distribution becomes more equal. Right, thank you very much for that clarification, Helga. And I would like to take also the question from Lucas Zanotta, linking to the human in the loop, uh, the possibilities to find in interventions, points of interventions to put humans within mm -hmm. the process. Mm -hmm. This is very crucial for the labor movement and for the work of work. 
because uh, Lucas says, how can trade unions participate in controlling the social effects of these technologies or in controlling any AI process in a workplace? What would be your thoughts about that? When, as I said, you know, try to identify where are the intervention points. And uh, I would say it's, if, if, if you start with who designs an AI, who is in charge with which goal to design it for, because you design it for a purpose, for a function, and you have to intervene there. Then you move on to the production. You know, again, in the production line, you have several intervention points where you can say, um, in, instead of having only one option, maybe we should, uh, in the production uh, line, give it several options. And you have several intervention points. And if you come to use uh, or to, to marketing or whatever you look at, you know, try to take the system apart without forgetting it's a system, but look at it and intervene in every possible step and ask the question, what is it for, who benefits, how can we make it uh, better? And it's not the human, it's not an abstract human in the loop, it's humans in the loop. And humans have interest and their vested interests and humans have different resources and uh, we don't all have the same resources. There is concentration of resources, concentration of power. So all this has to be taken into account, but start with the intervention points. And uh, Helga, um, um, about the resources and the points of intervention, particularly how would this look like in the, in the, gig, in the gig economy or in the gig work? I'm pulling here the question for pra Prakriti Dasgupta. He says, or yeah, the person says that um, if you could share your thoughts on how the nature of work could be done, if if um, people could be more informed and could be perhaps uh, more involved in the use, but also in the designs of algorithms in the context of the platform economy and gig work. I think that we have had some problems in having the humans really controlling the algorithm. What, what are your thoughts about that? Well, um, you know, as long as we don't even know which algorithms are used by the large corporations. Yeah, it's a very um, academic question how to control an algorithm because we, we don't know and it's their private property and they, unless, um, you know, regulation forces uh, the corporation that has the ownership of an algorithm, to publish it, to make it open source. Um, we, we don't know, and there is no way of controlling it. So in, in some uh, sense, you have to go back and to insist on, on regulation. And if um, the large corporation has to um, show and make it and, and publish its algorithm, then you can start to intervene. And, you, you can point out when, you know, it has certain flaws or it is very beneficial or it can be improved, etc. And the other thing, of course, is to, um, to strengthen the movement for more open access, for more, um, you know, we need open spaces uh, and we need open source technologies where everyone can contribute where people help each other to improve things for the common good, rather than only to make some individuals or their, their uh, firms uh, richer than they were before. So, uh, you know, this is a, is, is, is a much wider uh, issue, of course. And, um, you know, within the academic world, the idea of open source and uh, open publication, uh, open access, etc. This started like, um, you know, 15 years ago, and it was very marginal, and you had some people looking. By now, it's fairly, um, fairly much accepted by everyone. We have to move in that direction. And we need more collaboration 
uh, because people have diverse ideas and different perspectives and it helps everyone. So to, to strengthen this collaborative um, approach, uh, but it has to be open. Thank you, Helga. And uh, let's, now you were talking about big, big, big themes and, and uh, big academic discussions. There is a, a question from Noelia de Torres Boveda. And she's, she's worried or she's interested about fundamental rights. And she's asking, can we say that right, the right of information are or is the one of the new fundamental rights in the era of artificial intelligence? The right of information. Well, it, it depends what you mean by, by information and the, and the right of information. I mean, we need more rights. I would agree with that. But which kind of rights and how you define it, uh, because you also have to make sure that it is a right that, first of all, everyone, you know, agrees. This is something that uh, in this um, <clears throat> technological age in which we live, this is something new and we have to fight for it and, and we, we need this right. Um, <clears throat> well, whether it's the right of information, I, I, I am, I'm not sure because what do people do with the information? Yeah, And we all know the small print you get with everything. Yeah, <clears throat> you get, uh, you, you, you have, you're supposed to sign something and people tell you, yes, you have a right to information and you get three pages of small print that nobody is able to read through because you have want to, to sign quickly. And even if you read it through, you need a lawyer to explain to, to you what's written in it. And <clears throat> these are the, the kind of pitfalls. So we have to be uh, very much aware, you know, what a right has to be something that you understand, that you want to have for everyone and then you have to ask yourself yeah how can we how can we make sure that it's actually observed implemented and and so on and not just pushed aside to lawyers to litigate about it uh, if, uh, if if a litigation is possible at all and we know um, litigation is also quite expensive so many people just cannot afford it and this is the way how you know the system can easily be be um, tricked um, in the sense yes um, we are for a transparent AI and then you have an AI to uh, show what is transparency or explainability yeah and at first sight you say yes we want to have an explainable AI and we have a right to an explainable AI, just to give you another example. If you look closer, you discover for policy uh, matters, a lot exists in a gray area of compromises. But the AI forces you to be technologically very specific about your goal. And then you discover but, you know, there are two goals and there's a conflict between these two goals. I cannot have both. Now, in real life, you find a compromise. But the, the technology does not allow compromises. You know, it's either or. It's one or zero. Oh, my God. This is absolutely <laughs> fantastic. And our audience, they are asking to extend and stretch the session a little bit more. This is how, why we're going over the hours. So thank you for being with us. And uh, I would like to wrap uh, the, the questions from Theodora, from Antonio Jose Pastor, and from Fernando Rocha in one question. And it's about uh, the AI Act and the risks around AI, really. So as, as you mentioned in your talk, we are, regulation is very difficult uh, because of the conditions that you just explained. But we are really running, or the policymakers are really running in order to get this AI up and running very soon, perhaps by late of, of the autumn. And uh, Fernando is asking, what, what's your opinion about the AI Act, the proposal from the commission uh, regarding its impact on the world of work and uh, we know that this AI Act regulates high-risk AI systems or high-risk AI uses. 
And our audience is asking, uh, how far can these risks go? What are the, the, the possibilities that self-learning AI system is really a danger to humanity? What could be those existential risks that are can be hampered? Um, please, Helga, let, 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 yeah. um, let, me, let me just take one example. Um, in you know in the high risk zone first of all i think the approach of the commission to look at risk is a pragmatic one because you can revise it you know risk can be high uh, and after five years we discover well you know we thought it was high but it's actually low but we have other risks that nobody thought of five years ago yeah so i think that's a it's, it's a good approach but for instance if you take a face recognition yeah, which is in the high risk zone, and in my view, rightly so. Um, we don't want face recognition. Um, and if people don't want it, um, I think it is right to put it into the high risk. Why do we not want it? Because, um, well, some people say it has a dehumanizing effect, but it also, um, of course, it makes does have a dehumanizing effect. But on the other hand, um, you know, it makes you vulnerable. And I think there is a deeper emotional layer to it with, um, you know, your face being handed over to a machine and wherever you go, the way how you can enter is no longer by a key or by holding a card, but you know, you have to present your your face, and you know it. It has many deeper emotional, humanistic layers also. And the Chinese don't mind, or they have no chance to express their their dissent. So it's common in China. Um, <clears throat> it has functional advantages. But if uh, European citizens say uh, we don't want to have it, I think um, this should be respected because citizens should have a say. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you for that message on respect and autonomy, the autonomy of the European citizens and of all of us. Uh, I think, Helga, if this, there is no other question, this brings us to the end of our session. I'm very sad to close it, but we have to do it. A hearty Thank thanks you. To, to you, Helga Nowotny, and of course to our audience for being with us. And um, well, I hope that you have found today's episode interesting. I, I, well, by Thank the time you. we know that you have. Uh, thank you for turning into our AI talks at ETUI. See you next time. Thank you, Helga. Thank sure. you, everybody. Thank Goodbye. you. All the best. All the best to, to you and to your audience. Thank you.